Oh, good evening, everyone. Um, I, I see we got people already uh, complaining in chat that we are four minutes late for the first time in a very long time. But no, we've we're here. It's just Discord as usual is a pig because um, we don't. I know most people use Streamyard, and I I always find Streamyard a bit difficult to deal. But enough rambling about tech. Um, we're here to recap the Nomos event last weekend. Um, we we are joined by our uh, by a couple of guests and my usual co-host on these streams. Uh, since it is technically uh, your stream on a Monday, isn't it, Evan? It is indeed. Uh, I, I I don't know. I'll put myself responsible for coordinating it anyway. So uh, yeah, no, we, we've managed to bag both uh, Panama Hat and Millennial Woes to join us for a brief uh, period this evening to talk about our event in London last weekend. For those who are living on a, under a, a series of rocks of, of quite sizable mass, I would imagine, to be required to not know that we did a event <laughs> last weekend. But <laughs> we um. Yes, welcome guys. How 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 are uh, how are you both doing? <laughs> quick quick small talk before we start the real thing. <laughs> oh well, I'm doing. Uh, uh, hello, I'm Millennial Rose. I'm doing fine, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it was a good event. I enjoyed it. Yes, um, it was. I don't know. It it went off relatively well. Uh, we had a lot of we had a few people, a few ticket holders not turn up, but there was a lot of people who basically couldn't make it because of work or whatever. Um, thank you guys. We only had I think we only had like one refund um, from somebody who couldn't make it. Uh, the rest of the people were quite happy to kind of they were quite apologetic, um, and it was a decent turnout anyway. Uh, I was quite happy with it. it. It was quite funny in the lead up to the uh, to the event though, because when we when we did one in Birmingham, people were like, oh, I don't want to go to Birmingham. And then we did one in London. I was like, couldn't you do one in Birmingham? <laughs> so, <laughs> it was really quite funny. But yeah. no, we um, it was quite successful. It was nice seeing people on the Friday. We had a very good time with the Friday dinner, despite the uh, once again the venue not being ready for us. No. It seems to be a pattern uh, sometimes. Although the the Birmingham, I will say the Birmingham venue was uh, on the Friday night was very good. But yes, it was uh, an event based around. Of quite a broad topic of what do we want and i thought at least uh all three of you here answered that quite admirably uh and i'll start with uh woes what what are your reflections on on the the london event oh i i really enjoyed it it had an unusual atmosphere it was um two and a half years since i'd been to a conference and uh i mean every conference is unique you get very formal ones the most formal one I ever went to was in Germany. It was very academic and uh, it was quite quite different. Um, then you get more sort of cool ones and a nice big sort of fancy venue. Uh, and then you get more intimate ones, more cosy sort of places. Yeah, I mean, the venue is obviously a crucial thing. And in this case, it was a sort of, um, not to be too specific, but it was a sort of wine bar type location. And I'd... Uh, I don't think I've ever been to a conference in a place like that before. I mean, you can't, I don't know if conference is quite the right word. It was more like a, a sort of social gathering. Um, and there were five speakers, and I thought that was a good mix. I thought there was a, it was good that there was so much time for socialising. Uh, the speeches were fairly short, uh, nice and concise. I actually thought the Panama Hats was really good, how much he managed to pack into 15 minutes. I was very impressed by that. Thank you very much. Um yeah, I'm not just saying that. I mean, because it, it, 15 minutes, I mean, I didn't manage to hit that uh, deadline, that limit. Um, because 15 minutes is quite, uh, it, it, it's a challenge to pack a punch in that mm. in that time. Uh, well, we we mostly yeah. said that so it wouldn't be an hour. Wouldn't be an hour. You're, you were fine with the length of your speech, so we kind of had some elasticity. We always yeah. build in a bunch of spare time into our scheduling uh, to make sure people can socialize, but just to make sure everything runs smooth. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, th this is the kind of thing that, uh, as organisers, you have to uh, bear in mind. I I've never done this. I've never done uh, uh, an event, and it's something that I, I mean, I think I would find it very stressful. The the two of you seemed very casual <laughs> throughout the whole thing. I, I what was it? I mean, what was it? Uh, What's you're just putting on a brave face, or do you feel that it's something that you're just naturally good at? Uh, I don't know. It's just it's our third event now. As I mentioned when I was doing this sort of introduction and fair enough I've only been at it for a year but I don't know, I think by the time you have a third crack at something you've got to have a decent idea of what you're doing 
<laughs> Otherwise, you're just never going to get it to work. I think that, yeah. as well, also seeing the fact that, you know, how well Maven does with the Shieldings events, it's kind of like, mm. well, you know, we're not necessarily competition, but it's like the, there is some more competency out there. So there's always that kind of thing of like, well, you know, if they can do it and put on a, a sort of good show, then we should be able to do the same ourselves, even if we're having a slightly different approach to the whole thing. Maybe a slightly different kind of vibe, if I might use such a vague term. That you vibe check, yeah, vibe check. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. We 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 end up doing all the stress, the sort of the days before anyway. So once you get to the Friday, it's just kind of like you know everyone's there, everything's booked, everything's paid for. Ticket money sorted, speeches are printed, programs are all sorted and ready to go. It's just a case of, it, at that point, it almost just all kind of happens on its own. You just kind of have to be there to watch over it. Yeah, the the thing kind of takes on a life of it. So not not to be a complete dork, but like the the, the like the, the Katamari ball is already rolling down the hill. Uh, there's not really much, you can, you're kind of on top of it staring at it. So there's not really a lot you can do by the time it's time for the event. Uh, the few weeks before are always quite stressful, but uh, we kind of do these events slightly guerrilla style. And the reason it's in kind of a venue like we did it in is because you could just book those with with kind of very minimal details. Um, no, you know, the venue were quite good. The venue were quite happy. Um, I've not heard anything bad off them. In fact, I got a, a thing over back from them for us to review them and things like that. So there was, there's no, it, we've done three of these and they've always been quite, there's been a little bit of disorganization because Britain's kind of catering sectors is quite disorganized in general. Mm. But the, the I honestly, uh, if I, 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 listening to your speech when you said it, if I didn't know what was going on, if I wasn't plugged in, if I was somebody who was on staff or a casual observer, I'd have thought you were an environmentalist. Like, I don't tr cut the trees down in my backyard environmentalist, which is kind of funny. <laughs> um, and I would have honestly thought, not to, not to jump the gun on talking about speeches, but I would have thought AA was, a, was, like, a, was like a Marxist. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Well, well I was yeah. going to pivot over to ask uh, Mr. Hat what he thought of the weekend, and then yes. maybe we can get into the content of the speeches yes, as we go was, through them. Well, I mean, I I have no complaints whatsoever. I thought it was I thought it was absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, getting, I mean, I always love these kind of things just because you get to see everybody, you get to socialize, you get to catch up with people, you get to see some of the same faces and see some new ones as well. Um, I thought all the speeches were excellent. Um, you know, it was it was it was just just a, just a fantastic time. Um, as as these events always are, I yeah, because I, as you know, I I was a bit spooked when we went in. And I realized there was sort of going to be staff there the whole time, just like behind the bar, because I was like, oh god, hang on a minute, you know, we're going to get in trouble here. But it interests me because as we went through, the staff got increasingly more and more interested in what everyone was saying, mm. and then by the time that AA finished his speech, several of them were like applauding manically. When he finished. Really? They were, yeah, they were <laughs> they were applauding really well. It was um. There was, I think, it, I think she was a Spanish woman, and there was an, an Indian chap, and they were both, they were both applauding, uh, quite, quite prominently. Um, for AA was like, I did see people nodding along. Um, I did see people kind of looking ponderous, but not yes. alarmed. Um, well, I think, I think they were probably slightly confused as to what exactly we were. I mean, yes. I think maybe they thought we were kind of some very well dressed Marxists or something. But well, I don't it was know. the, it was the point where he'd, he'd sort of. Poo pooed progressivism, which had sort of made a few of them turn their noses up. Yeah. And then he got to the point where he was like, We were all booing Churchill, and some of them had to sort of double take. They're like, What <laughs> the hell is going on here? <laughs> Who are these people poo pooing progressivism, but are also like, Boo, Churchill, boo. You know, <laughs> we really broke the fact the model. That, yeah, the fact that we weren't like throwing Romans and doing any sort of stupid stuff, it left them yeah. with no clues as to, to sort of tie the whole thing back together. But there were some. There, I've forgotten which moments it it was now. But there were there were some moments where I thought they're catching on. That they're looking a bit unnerved by what someone had said in in one of the speeches, and um, I thought, what the what the hell? See, it's really weird. It's it's one of those cases where you come into contact with the normie world, and they are hearing what we say. <laughs> <laughs> and you realise how how different it is from the, you know, the normie world. They, they it makes you self conscious. I mean, it makes you well, it makes me worry 
how are they going to react? Are they going to shut this event down? Are they going to call a friend in Antifa? Are they going to call the police even? Um, I mean, it's, it would obviously be extremely unlikely, but in theory, they could. You know, if, if they thought these are a bunch of racists or you know, whatever, well, that's, Bash, uh, I don't know how they, what it would be in their minds, like white supremacists, I'm not sure. Well, that's why you've always got to carry the, the aesthetics of a Trotsky or a sort of Lenin character so that you uh, you slip past. I remember, and those at the first Nomotus event in uh, Manchester, I remember, I started that whole event by, you know, getting the, the whole sort of group of people that had turned up to this German beer hall that we were going to do an event in and got them to repeat, you know, essentially the start of the Communist Manifesto. We have a duty to fight. We have a duty to win. We have nothing to lose but our chains. And proceeded to say, you know, not the anti anti-Semitic German we thought we were going to hear from tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, when it yeah. came to my speech, I did tone down... Uh, one like one of the early paragraphs, but I think other than that, where it, it was talking about deep mass deportation, but other than that, it was uh, I didn't change anything from from the script, and so I think you know that's an interesting thing in itself, really. That the stuff we say is so I don't know. I was going to say tasteful or uh, subtle. Well, it's, that it's, it's, it's very I don't know. Sense, it's, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. yeah, so it's actually not that. I mean, it's not that shocking or controversial, you know. Where well, it's obviously controversial, but it's not intrinsically shocking to well, yeah, people. I, I don't I think. If you're not extremely sort of boorish, or you know, totally draped in the political symbology that we are all too familiar with, I think it is really hard for you know people who aren't somewhat interested in a bit of politics or history or this, that, or the next thing to piece together what you're talking about. Because if you take, you know, these obscure writers and events in history that people might not fully understand and you, you tie them together and deliver them to people that we know and we speak to often, it will not be delivered to them in a way that's easy to understand. And that's not necessarily because we deliberately go out of the way to obscure what we're doing, but just in the way that we communicate to one another, there is such a sort of build up of language already that it's just it's completely yes. above their heads mm -hmm. yeah yeah i did um I, I did think it was interesting when in his speech aa straight out said like the civil rights act is a load of tosh basically <laughs> we need to reject it and they they basically just the, all the staff just seemed fine they <laughs> like no, nobody batted an eyelid no i think yeah but I think a lot um, of the time people are just working as well. As yeah, exactly. They're not they're not really, you know, more, more interested in, in the job than listening to some event that happens to be going on at the, at the if, venue, I suppose. If you have something that's not couched in like forwardly cringe terms, where yeah. we're not, you know, it's the, 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 the reason we call it no moss and the reason we leave it generally a bit esoteric and a little bit ethereal about what it means and what we are is for that reason. It allows people to approach it in a, in a different way. And when kind of put in a neutral way, when they see it from a point of view that's not prefaced from these people are terrible people, what is being mm -hmm. said is surprisingly uncontroversial to many. The actual content yeah. of it is surprisingly uncontroversial, especially when it's put in slightly more technical terms or it's put like you did in your speech was it's put in in more of a semi-fictional context a hypothetical it almost felt like if you remember there's that whole speculative fiction you know the you will own nothing you'll be happy uh un thing that they put out the uh the, yeah. the world economic forum it kind of felt like a reply to that in some ways is that you know this is what the world will look like in in you know because uh, not to ruin the content of your speech for people, I don't know if it's been put up somewhere yet, has it? Or not yet, uh, not yet, not yet. Um, but yours was the kind of the the Britain of uh, you know twenty one hundred, yes, mm. and what that would ideally look like, the the positive vision, the like what we want in kind of a, a literal sense. And like I said, I was I sat outside and I was actually chuckling because I was waiting for some stragglers uh, who who were arriving, but I was just sat there chuckling because honestly, I thought. They're gonna think he's an environmentalist because <laughs> of what you were saying. I was trying yeah. to look at it from an yeah. outside perspective. I'm just like this. This doesn't. This doesn't. This is great because it doesn't feel, you know, forced. It doesn't feel edgy. Yeah. It feels very honest, really. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I don't think that many people could object to. Well, except for the demographic part of it, I don't really think anyone could object 
to, to anything that was in the speech. The only other thing that I think people would find objectionable is that men and women are treated differently. And that there are gen there are expectations of a woman to become a wife and mother, and a man to become self sufficient and to support a family. But um, other than that, I mean, and you know, it's incredible that that's even controversial. Yeah. Um, but on the environmental thing, it's notable because I think conservatives. I, I don't consider myself a conservative, um, or, and I don't like even considering myself right wing to be honest. But I think you know I am right wing in many ways. But I think conservatives once upon a time were very into the environment, and they saw it as an intrinsic part of well, identity and culture, nationhood, the the actual ecology of a, a country, the built up the, the natural environment in which our people have evolved and uh, developed their culture and so on. That was seen as very important. Mm. Uh, obviously, you can name any number of places in Britain that are that are important in that way. Uh, but it's the same in Germany, same in France, Netherlands, Sweden, and Norway. The... Uh, it was an intrinsic thing. So, of course, you it's natural for you to care about it. And uh, I think that one of the tragedies of the right throughout the 20th century is that they let go of all that stuff and let the left just take it. And then the left are the good guys because they're the ones who care about the environment. Because the right have been so autistic, it's so tone deaf, that they haven't thought, well, we should care about this as well and we should actively voice enthusiastic support of the environment. I also, but instead they've just left sorry. it to the lefties and the hippies. Sorry, that's me. I, I also think that the um, linking of rightist um, ideologies and, and movements with um, kind of market libertarianism and um, sort of, I suppose, um, what you'd call big business was um, quite harmful as well because it kind of prevents that sort of stuff. I think a lot of energy was given towards kind of uh, uh, what you'd call the kind of economic side of things. Mm. Um, as in, in, in opposition to kind of um, what we what you'd call socialism or or, or um, any any of that kind of strand. So it's you know I, I I basically agree that that a lot of actually helpful things were neglected and instead of too much too much um well, too much weight was was given to that kind of thing. Well, it's kind of it's very sort of, it's very sort of soft territory for the left as well because to really want to conserve the environment and the sort of ecology as it is runs directly countenance to the sort of big business progressive kind of image. You know, you cannot have continuing industrialization, continuing mm -hmm. building of mass educational institutions and this, that and the next thing without destroying ecology. Without completely, you know, polluting rivers and the stuff that actually matters, not the nonsense about CO two being confused with water vapor. Yeah, yeah exactly. Your, yeah, your microplastics yeah. and your stuff that gets leaked into the soil, and the fact that people now have bloody what do you call it, pollen allergies because they don't eat from their local food chain anymore, and they just eat mm -hmm. stuff from abroad that doesn't agree with the local flora and fauna that they should be interacting with. Yeah, and and actually, it's interesting because I think that the left have, to some extent, moved away from environmentalism because it's a it's another it's a it's a version of nativism where mm. you're you're and it's also because they deny that there's any such thing as male nature and and even human nature, female nature. So in a similar way, I think they're averse to the idea of the natural world because well, that's limiting. You know, to try, the the whole transhumanist thing seems. It's, it seems to take as, as a premise, an axiom, that well, we're not tied to nature. We're not tied to the natural world. The natural world really shouldn't be very important for us. It's all about, I mean, you know, if you think about someone like Bosch, it's just the perfect consumer. And there He's is nothing meaningful there. Uh, yeah, uh, and before, there's nothing meaningful. Yes, before we go any further, I'll just do some boilerplate stuff that we've got people filtering in. Uh, if you want to ask questions, we are somehow still fully monetized. So you can uh, support through YouTube, you can support through Streamlabs, which I've linked. Uh, that's the best way, really, since they take the smallest cut. We will be reading uh, viewer questions, paid and unpaid, but the, the best way to guarantee your question gets seen is to send either a Super Chat or a Streamlabs donation. Or you can become a member if you want to support us monthly, normal kind of YouTube -y stuff. 
and I will I will be very cringe and say interacting with the video in whatever way you want to does like it does stop us completely disappearing. Yeah. Since I've started asking people, Please, since uh... I've started doing the cringe like subscribe comment shit, it has it has affected our reach massively. Please do your We've ritual summoning of the algorithm yes. gods in the comments. <laughs> I, I'm 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 afraid you have to you have to play the game a little bit on someone like YouTube. It just stops us not being served to people because if you watch a video but don't interact with it, YouTube sees you as like being bored by it essentially. So uh, that's that's the normal YouTube boilerplate stuff out the way. Yeah, well, we get into the speeches for the evening then, which I will stop mentioning. So then you can all compliment how good my speech was at the start. Yes, well we've got some photo. I see him in chat. There we've got some photographs here of the speakers, um, c courtesy of Yasin, who is in the chat, our designated photographer. Uh, we have a lot, a few more pictures. Up, there, but, yeah, we <laughs> want to make sure that we if we do put more out. We want to censor them properly and make sure that you know. Only people who are comfortable with their faces being out have their faces out there mm. and things like that. Uh, so we will be, I think, just using pictures of the speakers I got, uh, this uh, evening. Middle Eastern photo Mario. Yes, uh, <laughs> I just he's he's saved in my phone literally just as Polaroid man. Um, <laughs> so yes. yeah, you you were the you were the first speaker of the evening. Uh, you you did do the the introductory talk, which was kind of a, a definition. I I liked again. You didn't really sidestep the topic, but you you added some specificity to it. I think about like, who, well, the title of your speech was "Who of this we you, who is this we you speak of?" Well, yeah, it's just I I always consider when we do these things that I I tend to come up with most of the kind of conceptual stuff, and sometimes that'll be the theming and. Really, I'm thinking of a theme not so much that is a great question, but as one that means that you... And this is something that I, I uh, we can get on to a bit more when we talk about Woz's speech as well, because we discussed it afterwards. That you, you think about what it is that we want, and then you consider for a while the fact that actually it's really not that easy. You know, I even say this at the start of my speech, you know, we... We will normally, uh, which of course can be read on the uh, Substack as it was uploaded earlier on today for those that are interested. You know, we we reflexively say, well, we want to enforce our values, or we want to clear them out, or that's that. And the next thing, and in shorthand, that is a satisfactory answer. But I don't think we should do ourselves the disservice of just being like, oh yeah, clear them out. That's it, because within that there is so much about how. Well, how do you go about clearing them out? Who is those that you're clearing out? And what I thought was most important, actually, is to consider the fact that if we are to consider what we want, we have to consider who we are. And we have worked out through our previous events that we are the vanguard. But what are we the vanguard of? You know, to what is it that our... I think literally the line I use is to what is it that our vanguard serves or is there to protect? Mm. And I think it, it really comes down to the important distinction of culture and civilization that you cannot fall back on which uh, I think maybe I would need to write more about this and think about it more but we could really get into the, the realms of arguing that just talking about western civilization is really just talking about the progressive image western civilization doesn't mean what it meant three four hundred years ago when it was latin christendom or prior to that when there's a holy Roman empire or this that and the next thing it just means refrigerators lorries uh, euthanasia services and hospitals and mass culture instead of you know true British and European culture which are these ways in which we actually come in touch with the, the discomfort that people experience, experience through life that gives them meaning and that they can demonstrate that to us through art through poetry, through all sorts of things through writing if some of us give it a, give it a bash and I've, I don't know I just feel this is an, it's an incredibly important distinction that we could that we should really think on. Oops, uh, for those asking in the chat, uh, I, I posted it earlier. Um, it, it's in the chat above, but on our Substack, antipolitics.substack.com, Evelyn's speech has been posted today, and my speech will be posted on either Wednesday or Thursday. So uh, probably Thursday, actually, to coincide with our stream on Thursday. So Evelyn's post speech is already up in text form, and mine will be up later in the week. Uh, Woes was good enough to record uh, a lot of the speeches. I think everyone apart from yours, Evelyn, got mm. recorded. Yeah, and I, I wanted to apologize to you for that. I didn't know that it was about to begin. Um, right. I think I was outside chatting to someone, so I, I do apologize for that. It wasn't uh, deliberate or anything. 
No, no, it's fine. Mine's was a, a shorter sort of intro speech anyway, because I think, and it's not it's not to say that I'm not keen on doing it, because I think with the the two previous speeches I did at Manchester and Birmingham, some of them were a bit longer, but it it took a little bit of a longer path to really frame the approach to the question. Whereas it was one of those things where very often I struggle making my writing succinct, you know, that 15 minute time frame and squeezing into there can be a real challenge because you just want to go on and on and on. And I actually kind of got it when I was writing it. I got to about 1200 words and I got most of the structure and I was like, wait, that's it. I don't need to add anymore. Just leave it as it is. Add no more confusion. And I think it played in incredibly well to the approach you took for your speech was, if you don't mind us chucking a picture of you up on the stream. God, well, I, just to warn everyone, I am fat. I've put on weight. That's all right. It's a uh, winter weight. But you took yeah. an approach. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it is. Sort of harsh <laughs> winter in the rolling. You're going to be ready for You'll the cold. Glad of that when the rolling blackouts hit. I know exactly. <laughs> no, he's prepared. Yeah, uh, I can I'm get the other one the up game. anyway with yeah. the lighting's more flattering. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you, you took an approach that was fictional. You didn't demonstrate to us your vision of what you wanted or what we should want through intellectual sort of sources or this or that specific writer. You literally just told us what you wanted through the avenue of the story of several characters. I believe it was Sarah, Timothy, Brian, their parents and the way in which they were interacting what you referred to as the England of 2100. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, Okay, to go into this, I chose 2100 other than 2200 simply to avoid, it was too similar to 2022. So I wanted it to just be, okay, I'll just say 21. So 20, uh, 2100, that was it. It was just, uh, but it doesn't really, here's the thing, it doesn't really matter whether it's 2100, 2200, 2300, I don't really care. As long as we get to something like that, um, I don't really care how long it takes. Um, now, the reason for going the fiction route was I spent, I have, I have been writing short stories, fiction, over this uh, last six months, but that's sort of incidental. Uh, the reason I went the fiction route with this was it was the only way that I felt I could do it within, within a short time frame, because... I kept writing ideas down. Every This is something that other people should maybe bear in mind. Don't rely on your memory. If you're planning some creative project, write down every idea you, you have for it because things, you know, things fall away easily. Um, so I kept writing ideas into this file. And then I thought, how the hell am I going to organize all of these? And I'll have to explain each of them. And it was things like... Uh, I don't like LED streetlights. <laughs> it was things like, I don't like plastic. I don't think shop frontages should be uh, made in plastic because it's unsympathetic to the surrounding environs. Uh, it was things like ma male and female. How should education be structured? What would be better than what we've got now? And why would it be better? Uh, what should what conception should people have of their nation? Um, it, all of this stuff that take ages to to go through all of that in terms of argumentation and to justify each of these claims it would take ages to like 45 minutes an hour to do that and i have done speeches of that length but that this that what wouldn't have been appropriate here so i thought okay the only way i can do this is just to present it as a sort of fait accompli <laughs> and say wouldn't this be nice wouldn't this world be nice and it has these different attributes and I, I don't need to explain each one of them because it plays an obvious role in the overall thing uh, and it all works together cohesively so, so that was the approach I took and I only had the idea to do this two days before the event so I wrote the, the script in two days now if I'd had longer to work on it I would have probably added more about different aspects of the society like the is there an aristocracy? Is there a class system? But there, there is a class because that is already mentioned. But I would want to add more about that. I'd want to add more about the role of the metropolis in the nation, like London. Um, 
maybe even talk more about the after effects of our age, or what's mm. referred to in the script oh. as the rainbow era. Um, and, a, and maybe even, yeah, sorry. Yeah, play track. But it was also the fact that you, you had one of the characters, I think it was Brian, who was, he, you know, I think the most important part of it, because you had, you'd basically sort of reached back into what was the norm prior to, you know, <clears throat> you say 1945 which i think is a period we would all roughly agree upon and that the importance of the society pre-1945 wasn't so much that everyone existed within the norm that they did but the people who were outside of that norm were not facilitated to destroy it they maybe were exactly they maybe were allowed to question it they were allowed to look at it from different perspectives and some of these might even be things that actually benefit and reinforce the norm and why it's important but there was there was no you know incentive structure for here here you go study at university for five years for this subject and then just go and destroy Western literature. There is none yes. of that, and I think that was that is the the key part to it. I think that really brings it all together is that it's not just the norm enforcing upon the norm, but the norm enforcing upon everyone else that doesn't fit into the brackets. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and I feel very well qualified to talk about this because I went to art college. I'm a natural outsider. Some would say a bit eccentric. And I, when I was young, I sort of basked in that. I thri- thrived on it. But then you realise, well, there are limitations to being an outsider. Uh, and then there are good things about conformists. There are good things about normal people that, that I don't have. And so you learn some humility. And then you start thinking, and I spent so much time attacking them. And I spent so much time attacking the idea of there being a norm. And now I realise that society absolutely cannot function without norms. So the real problem for us, if I might speak presumptuously, is not that there are norms, but that are, but that the people in defining those norms have are not us. We are not the ones in a position of influence. So we have to put up with the nonsense that is imposed on conformist people by nihilists, uh, perverts, scum, uh, arch capitalists, uh, people like look at what Bill Gates has done over the last few years, for example. And I know it wasn't him working on his own, but still, he was clearly an influential voice in all of that. Um, so where was I going with this? Yeah, so the what we really want is is simply is not actually to do away with social norms or whatever, but actually to reinforce them, to have good ones instead of bad ones. Because in our age, there is so much to criticise. There's so much to be resentful of in popular culture. I mean, it's absolutely awful. It's poisonous. It's destroying people. So... I thought rather than go into all of that and the different ways in which it destroys people and all that, just present a nice um, picture of a sort of pastoral um, of a co- picture of a cohesive, functional, healthy society You're in which the like people a, are. A sort of narrative Bob Ross, as it were. Just happy little Brian's <laughs> and Sarah's and Timothy's. Just one there, one there. And it, yeah, exactly. And it, I think the. It, I could explain that the the three characters, so it's three siblings, one girl and her two brothers. And the importance there is you've got the woman, you've got the conformist normie male, uh, Timothy, and then you've got the rebel, dark, uh, artistic, creative. And I think those are three archetypes. And they exist in, in our society these are three things and each of them in our age is abused and misled and a good society is one which uses these archetypes these types of people in a healthy way directs them in a healthy way so that was what i tried to uh, show and indeed a healthy society i think can't be healthy without those three types of people you need the the woman who's submissive and loyal and affectionate and sweet and you need the guy who is normy and just gets the job done and isn't too rebellious or difficult. He, he's, he's conscientious and efficient and intelligent. And you need that random element 
of the the creative turbulent guy as well. So it was just an obvious three people to have there and to tell the story through. So well, not that there's a story, it's just a picture of a society. So there you go. Anyone else get anything to add or shall I? I was just going to say, I did enjoy how ground level it was. Mm. Um, and you said about, you know, the, the structure, kind of the, the structure doesn't really matter above those people. What matters is, is those people's lives really. And that's focusing on that. I thought was a very important aspect, but uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I think Evelyn was trying to intro us. So I'll let her intro there since we do have, uh, we do have up next Mr. Panama hat speech, don't we? Well, um, I will, I will just say as a, as a cap on what, what, what was said is that I, I thought it was particularly good because it really answered the question in a in a kind of to the matter way. It, you know, it wasn't some kind of um, vision of like a grand um, sort of political plan or anything. It was well, here is you know, if 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 we consider the lives that we live now to be inadequate, then here is the vision of a of a, of a good life. You know, um, you know, lived lived in a way that. You know, essentially, that our ancestors would have would have lived that that basically all all humans sort of in in a way that all humans should live and and deep down want to live. Um, so yeah, but basically, it it answered the question flawlessly. I thought I thought it was a bit. I thought it was a very very good and and creative way to tackle it. Well, thank you very much. I, I do appreciate that. Um, I, I agree that it, it's uh, it would be difficult to do it. To talk about the society above them would be, as uh, Scrum said, that would be that would just take too long. So it was just, what is, uh, how do these three people live? Now, as I say, if I'd had longer, I probably would have gone more into the social structure. But mm. I thought it was just important well, to say, how is how do they live? What what are, what are their lives like? What are their expectations? Their life plans and so on. So there you go. Well, no, I think I said to you not long after your uh, talk had just been that. You know, our our job's not to dictate what these characters should be doing in their life or, you know, fully realising the structure of government that's perfectly required. It is just to make it so that these people might exist. You know, people yeah. who are that authentic and that genuine and that, you know, and that sense that we look back on, that normal. <laughs> it's, yeah. It seems so sort of reductive <laughs> in a certain sense, but... When you have the whole contextualization of the story you put before us, it's like, well, of course, how could you how could you think anything else or want anything else? Yeah, yeah. And there was some somebody said to me, deep down, everyone wants the Shire. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord of the Rings. That's yeah. basically it. And uh we might uh, flavor it differently with the technologies of our time, the things that we've come to accept and expect. But ultimately, the lifestyle that we want is still that. It's still this pastoral, this rural idyll. Although, um, um, I, 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 I know this may, this may be too, too large of a kind of uh, sidetrack, but um, I was actually speaking with um, um, some, some, some others about, about this thing about the Shire, and they, they said that, like, um, fundamentally, you have your Shire, but you also need to continue the Lord of the Rings analogy. You, you also need sort of room for your elves. And you're kind of warriors, and you're sort of um, sort of uh, adventurers. And the example they used was, you know, if you look at say the Elizabethan world, where you basically all over England you would have had the Shire essentially, but then you also have your Walter Raleigh's, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you think so? How how do you how do you see that kind of fitting with the vision that you that you sort of put forward um the other week that that's someone that's a di that's like a mix of brian and timothy because that's someone who's probably very conscientious and stable within himself and yet has a taste for the exotic and mm -hmm. the unknown the, to explore and conquer and i think this is that i mean this is a big thing this is why i didn't say that it was just the the villages and there has to be the metropolis as well yeah, you spoke like... of him feel, feeling more attracted to the metropolis and feeling more like he, he but you yeah. know, his people were there um, as, as kind of the turbulent artist. Yeah, exactly. Drawn to the metropolis. And I, I use the term drawn to it because that implies danger as well. He might, Brian needs it. He needs to do that. 
but it's not going to be entirely good for them <laughs> because that's just what the metropolis is like whether it's berlin or new york or london um etc so I, that's that's definitely part of it but also in terms of exploring you know th this is just to answer what, what panama hat just said i think uh the village isn't enough i mean d d not for me anyway you know i think that i want a society to be moving towards things and if it's like that i think that life for ordinary people should probably just stay the same from one generation to the next i think that's and throughout a lifetime that people want and yeah. need a lot of stability and permanence continuity um but also the society should be doing something and whether it's space exploration scientific exploration uh ocean exploration I think that there should be a sense of progress. Because otherwise, life yeah. is just around in a circle throughout all of history. And uh, that's, I don't see that as fun, rewarding, satisfying, admirable. Well, I mean, and I also don't think it's a fitting thing for the human condition either. I do, I do believe somewhat in kind of custodialism that it is fairly normal for life not to really change significantly. Um, over the course of say several generations, um, but I but I do also agree with what you say that you're always going to have people in that model of the Shire who you know you know I'm I'm sure that most of them will basically be happy to just continue in the role of their father to pass that then onto their sons and so forth. But that, as you say, there'll always be that person that wants to leave and go to the metropolis. You know, um, think of uh, Shakespeare leaving. Stratford upon Avon to, to go to London and, and and make his way as a writer and actor, you know, or that well, kind of thing. Or, or as I said, the explorers or soldiers, you know. Would, uh, Absolutely. Would have H.P. Lovecraft been doing what he's doing had he not gone to New York and seen the uh, shocking Red, display Red of demographics yeah. of swarthy types? <laughs> Get swathed on. Well, no, 1% of the population is Jewish Whoa. slash Irish slash Italian. It's over. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. you, you, you mentioned uh, Lovecraft, but of course, part of his kind of formation was the fact that he grew up for the first few years of his life in this very well-to-do New England family with a very large house full of servants. And he just expected that that, would, that, the, that was the way things were going to be. He would just continue in that. And then when he was, I think, about 10, they lost it all and ended up having, having to move to a very small house with no servants. And all of a sudden there was no money and there was an expectation that he would have to give up this kind of patrician way and go out and, and make a living, which, of course, he never did. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, it, but, you know, there, there, there will always be that kind of change as well. You know, and some, some people are formed by the fact that they grow up expecting one set of circumstances and then it changes before they're able to live it. Um, so it's always something to consider, isn't it? Definitely, definitely. Just to uh, answer what you said there, I think that is possibly a fourth person who could have been in the story, like a fourth sibling could have been someone who was an explorer. So he'd be a mix of those two, but he, he would have that desire to, or, and we say desire, like they want to explore, but I think it would be more fitting to say that they need to explore because it's not something that we should trivialize or dismiss, you know? It's like the creative type wants to create. Well, they yeah, have to do it. But he, he, he has to. I mean, it's his nature. He has mm. to. Um, and I think in the same way, there are people who just have to get out and like, it's, it's not the inner turmoil that they need it's the outer it's the world the the universe and uh so that would that would have probably been a, a worthy addition there to the, the explorer the soldier the warrior um so someone did say to me that uh, he would have added a thing about uh weapons and self-defense and martial uh, like they just ability the ability of men to defend their, their their property and so on and that's something that i i probably could have gone i could have emphasized that i thought it was sort of implicit mm. uh, that every guy is going to have a you know a, a shotgun and they'll know how to use it for self-defense you know like, call out still, the militia you know yes. yeah it, it could have been done with being explicit well, yeah I, I was thinking um, more yeah. of a an extremely high trust vision where justice was a, a dirty business not to be spoken of because it wasn't required mm. yeah well the, the other thing is of course that the world the society that I paint in that uh, 
in the script is one that's only possible in a an ethno a, a mono ethnic society. I mean, you it just there simply wouldn't be well, the social trust. Uh, I think it's a redundant term to add society. There, you cannot have multi ethnic society. It is the it is the void of society at that point? Yes, yes. It's like saying a multi brain organism. I mean, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so kind shall of freakish. <laughs> shall we carry on then? For I was very impressed by the hat's attempt to conjure up as much Bowden energy as possible. It was and there was an impressive high, amount of it. Extremely high Bowden energy. Your speech, though, was called Cutting the Knot, which I got instantly. I know you were slightly worried people wouldn't understand the uh, yeah. the Gordian Knot reference. But it was a very rousing speech. Well done. I got a lot of very positive well, I was, comments about, uh, I, about I was it. I was hoping for it. I, I am still... I am still moving towards my goal of no notes at all. Just complete stump speech from the heart. Well, not really from the heart. I would I would do some preparation in advance, obviously, because if you're being invited to speak and you're being given meals and a place to stay and everything and not being asked to pay, then you need to give them something good. You know, you can't you 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 can't take the risk of uh of, of sort of giving them a damp fuse. So I would do some some prep, but yes, I I am edging ever closer to that to that uh, that goal. Um, of just the you know no no notes at all because it's it's a very effective way of speaking. I mean, it's 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 one of those small things where if you appear you know no notes, not looking at anything, just your hands and the audience basically, it's automatically a way more sort of rousing speech. That's uh, what I did in Birmingham, and I wish I'd done that here. Although I I was very tired by the end of the evening, and I did I did require my notes. I did manage to horrendously smudge smudge my glasses, so I was unfortunately quite glued to my notes. But that was just a function of me not being able to see or remember. Yeah. Uh, but no, it, it, I, you are right. It does give off a very a very personal energy. There's less barrier between you and the audience. Yes, um, but yes, I was I was aiming for that. It also it also to be fair did help. That due to a printing error, my short, um, less than two thousand word speech ended up being printed across about thirty seven pages um, because the, <laughs> font, the font was about it was like it was like point fifty eight or something. It was, it was gigantic. So that did mean that did mean though that I could sort of step back a bit and I could I could step a bit sort of back from the table and still be able to read what was written. So I, I, I may so have the. Uh... Future, the yeah. Biden teleprompter font. Didn't yeah, you? I was exactly, say, we'll, yeah, we'll get the teleprompter with like the the <laughs> cards, one word to a card. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, no, it was. Um, I I I enjoyed doing it, and uh, yes, it was. It was. Uh, I I hope I hope the energy was good. I have to say, I I found that the acoustics were were excellent as well mm. in that in that sort of quite echoey sort of hall we were in. Completely and, accidental, um, but yeah, we we seemed to good, like the. Wasn't it? Yeah, the the acoustics were quite good in the Birmingham where we had to do it without microphones because uh, they completely messed up our uh, AV equipment. Um, yes. that, that, that mercifully was a relatively uh, acoustic <laughs> room as well. But do you want to go into slightly like, what 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 do you mean by cutting the knot then for people who are confused at home? What what, so, what was the what was the main thrust of your your rousing speech? Well, like like you said, the the title was decided well in advance. Um, I didn't really have one. I sort of came up with it because I knew it would work either way. As it was said, obviously a reference to the Gordian knot of Alexander, where it was this giant, uh, sort of massive, um, like sort of rope knot that was legendarily hard to untie and nobody could do it. And then Alexander the Great supposedly came along and just chopped it in half with his sword. And the the general idea was I wanted to overcome this problem we have on the right of sort of what do we want, where we spend all our time arguing for like competing visions and strategies and this or that and do we you know do we go this option or this option or or whatever and i wanted to kind of say well let's just jump over that let's let's bring it down to the most basic distilled principles it's like well we're after this we're after this we're after this you know in in order to achieve a we need b that 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 kind of thing um so i went through basically um if we want basically if we want to achieve anything we need some form of power that doesn't necessarily mean being, you know, supreme overlords of, of the UK or whatever, but power can mean just the ability to live your own way of life, for example, um, the ability to resist attempts to change things that you don't want to be changed, the ability to decide um, what's going to happen to your children and, your, and to your family, the ability to decide um, where you're going to live and how you're going to live, that kind of thing. Um, 
so the crux of the speech um kind of uh somewhat inspired by um aa's recent writings was basically about well if we're going to do any of this we need some sort of power um and then i also went around things sort of well you know how how do we avoid these various traps and, and, and pitfalls that we might that we might end up falling into um and i, I did quite a bit of ad-libbing as well i don't entirely remember what what i ad libbed but there was um uh, I, I I did actually extend the speech quite significantly with just uh, sort of off script bits, um, but that that was that was the that was the general thrust of it. Well, no, I'm I'm always a fan of re-emphasizing the importance of just organizing within the movement. Yes, having a central vision which is distinctly radical from the world around you, because irrespective of the context of what the movement supports, what the vision is, or how exactly you organise it, as long as you get these things done, that's the that's the goal. You know, it's almost yes. in the same sense you're talking about with uh, the stuff that AA's been doing recently. You know, screw the ideology and what exactly you want for a certain moment and look yes. exactly to what what needs to be done to get what we want <laughs> mm-hmm. uh yes there was a big stress on organization and greater control um because you have to start building kind of power within your own ranks i suppose it's a, it's a little bit like the old adage of um sort of putting your own house in order before you sort of mm. go and change change clean society your around room, you. buckle exactly yeah. clean clean your room you know merit <laughs> uh, but yeah, but yes, um, that 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 was the basic thrust of it. It wasn't. I mean, like like most of the speeches I give, I try and just stick to a relatively simple concept at the heart of it. So there isn't too much more to say in terms of the content. Um, that's basically it. How, how many speeches have you given? Um, well, I've I was in terms of this community. I did this one. Uh, I did the event back in August, the Nomos event in February. And the event last year, but I, before I was into any of this, I was I was um, very much into public speaking and that kind of thing. Um, so I do have a bit of a, a, a background in it. Um, I, I actually took the, in fact that um, that that uh, fob on the end of my watch chain you can see in the pictures in some of them is uh, the English speaking board um, sort of medallion thing which I I took. So I. Um, I have quite a bit of a, a background in public speaking and um, uh, debating and that kind of thing. So you All went right. to get your? Uh, is that does that mean you have your speaking license then? Yeah. Yes, I have. I have a license to speak. Yes. Um, just <laughs> a quick, a quick super chat here. Uh, says Nomos was great. It was nice to meet all of you. And Woes, thanks for recommending me Shadows of Fear. I've been enjoying it all weekend. So we got we do. Oh, have fantastic! Fantastic. I was wondering, I remembered recommending that to, to a guy and I was thinking, I wonder if he's watched it or if he's just forgotten all about it. <laughs> I'm no, really it's... glad he's... Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, I... it's, it's just an obscure early 70s drama series that I oh, recommended. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> in, in terms of you, Panama Heart, did you find that, you know, after your speech or before, did you have a lot of people come up to you? I, I know it was quite a friendly atmosphere and we try and keep it that way. We try and keep it quite cordial. Um, how, how did you find, I, I know my favorite part and I always, this is always the cheesy bit is, is manifesting it in reality. It's making the community real. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, people were very roused by your speech. I did notice that people were very receptive. And like I said, I had a lot of very positive comments yeah, was, about it. But... quite pleased by that. Yes. It's always, yeah. it's always fun to see. But even beforehand, did you find that people were quite open, quite good at coming and talking to you? Or... Always. I did notice a few people sitting in corners, but not that many. Um, I mean, yeah, the atmosphere is always great. I mean, the thing is, at this point, I've been to enough events that I know like sixty percent of the people in the room. So you know, <laughs> there's always there's always people coming up and asking them things, and I see, I see people I know and go and chat to them. And I have to say, uh, always very appreciate the amount of drinks being bought me. Um, at uh, at at one point, there were like three separate glasses of wine and a glass of Bailey's in front of me because <laughs> after the speech, a few people offered drinks. Like I I can't say no. So. Uh, well, that was, that was I have noticed there's a slight sort of sidetrack, but the way I sort of uh, shall we present myself on the internet, it makes me somewhat more recognisable, which I think is like a great touchstone for a lot of the people who haven't 
been to the events before or they're not, you know, they don't know other people that are going via Discord or Telegram mm-hmm. or this, that, and the next thing. So to a certain extent, they're like, ah, right, there's the, there's the tall blonde one. At least I know that's the right group of people. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a kind of a concept. I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit more anonymous in the way that I look and that I look aggressively normal in many ways. So it's quite, <laughs> if I, when I have to kind of preface talking to people sometimes. Hiding your power levels. Yeah, yeah. who I am. And oh, yo, oh, yo, Scrum. Oh, thank you for, you know, <laughs> I get a lot of that. A lot of the people, obviously, I've met before. There's the London Weavers, who I'm very grateful to, who are a great bunch of people, very organized. Um, they they fill out our ranks um, quite, you know, quite consistently and reliably. It's quite good to have that just well of organized people who meet regularly to, to draw from who are hungry for this kind of stuff. I'm always very, very grateful of their kind of assistance and receptiveness to all this. But it's it's it is like I said the the main thing I enjoy about these events is manifesting mm. the community into real life. It's, it's having it's is the... having everyone there. It is the most important part because it's we we don't get anywhere. We don't build you know even a resilient organization of people without meeting face to face regularly, getting to know each other, trusting one another, actually learning about who you know we are sort of collectively outside of just posting stuff on the internet. I mean, I as I said it to a few people as well during the weekend, that it's great to always go to these things and talk about interests and ideas or, you know, what are you working on? What what can we do? But genuinely, sometimes I just want to, like, have a blather with people. Like, And I always use the phrase, you know, mm-hmm. what's your script? What are you about? Yeah, you, yeah. You, who are you as a person? Because... These are ultimately the sort of more particularist elements of people that need to be integrated into the organization. And that's, I think that fits more sometimes together than just putting people together because they have certain skills. They can have all the skills they want, but if they've not got personalities that work together, it's never going to happen. Well, in that vein, we've just got a donation from Coney Current Year, who was at the event, a long time actually supporter of the channel. So thank you. And it was nice to see you as well. Uh, great to see speakers at the event. Meeting and talking with like-minded people at IRL is very rare, but very revealing. Uh, Woe's speech was very inspiring. AA's was the funniest. Love sharing wine and conversation with Hat. So uh, a, a good time had by Mr. Coney Current Year there, who's a, oh, yes. a yes. name I recognized. And yes, his name... I, was, I was shocked to discover that Coney... 2012 is in fact not a black Ugandan man. Uh, <laughs> very shocking. Uh, very, however, very shocking. Seeing as how he's mentioned it, I suppose we should get to, I think what we could arguably oh, oh. call one of the the highlights of the evening, which was A's speech, which oh, was yeah. sort of, I thought at first this might be a bit unstructured. Where's he going to go with this? But is he just kind of kept building momentum and going through each of what he referred to as his 59 theses, <laughs> uh, which I believe are all up on his substack and we're up later today for anyone that wants to go give it a listen. Yes. But they, he just he started off with some of the stuff we all know from the elite theory and then adds a bit of the juvenile on top of that and then continued on and on and on to get to the stuff. It was like a greatest hit speech. Yeah, great. that kind of was. It was very much an evening with the academic agent. It was like a long encore. <laughs> <laughs> it was See, quite this is, I, I thought it was great and I was really glad uh, that he's put it up to date because I had recorded it and I said and he, he, he didn't seem that bothered about, uh, about you know, putting it up anywhere, publishing it and I said to him, look, it was really good content <laughs> and, I've, and I've recorded it for you so please put it up But um, and I just said that to him at the event and uh, now he's put it up so I'm really glad because I thought it was great very concise, you know, very fast mm. moving through all these different ideas. And um, as you said, it was that gave it the structure that it needed. So a really good speech. Uh, the, the, the 59 Theses was, uh, I, 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 you, it is in his sub stack. Uh, I think it's a paid one currently. I'll, I'll yes. link it in the, side, in the sidebar for people. But them the breaks, I'm afraid. This stuff doesn't happen for free. Uh, and if you if you want to hear them in person, do make sure you come to the next one. But it was it was really just uh, it felt like he'd lined up all these little plates and was like knocking them down. Uh, <laughs> and it fit it fit with the the theme of the event. It wasn't just he'd come in and like reheated 
his content, but this is his wheelhouse. He has kind of been answering this for quite a while. And it was nice for him just to put all these things in one place, being like, look, this is what we want. This is what we know about what we want. This is how we know that, you know, just having ideology and just believing things doesn't work. And kind of here's, here's just all like, uh, not to be cliche, but like the red pills in rapid succession. Mm. He, he basically just like fire, ho- like hose down the audience with them. But the, uh, some... the, the point at the end, though, I thought really put it all back together. We came into this idea, which I believe is from a lot of the stuff he's putting into his next book. But, you know, we, we aren't, we are heading towards a winter. We are not people of a kind of summer. It's, it's dark times. It's, it's cold. It's damp. The conditions are not favourable. However, there will be a spring. It has to come at some point. And, you know, much like you put forward in your point, was it's not about, you know, this specific construction of society or adherence to this specific ideology, but just making sure that the spring is a good spring. Absolutely, and I think that something that has actually thwarted our side for a long time is this assumption that, well, we're going to win, mm. and uh, we're just going to talk about how we're going to win. How we're going to win, everyone, and and so it gets you off on this wrong footing. Of, I mean, I remember a certain politician. I won't name. Well, uh, a certain guy in our sphere. About five years ago, he was saying, "All right, we're going to set up this new party, with an uh, the goal being that uh, we'll be in number ten Downing Street eighteen months from now." Well, uh, what yeah. the hell are you? What the what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, There's that's just setting the... up. It's setting up a goal that you cannot possibly meet. So therefore, you're setting you and your supporters up for inevitable disappointment. Well, I think it. You it... See what I mean? It goes Magical beyond thinking is what it is. I think it goes beyond that as well, though, because it's not just about recognizing how almost kind of futile and pointless uh, by the books kind of political party is for you know engaging what we want, but also that we must be aware of the times within which we live. We are not. We do not have the culture that produces heroes. It does not produce martyrs. It fabricates them out of history. It makes them up because not just because they they want to, but because they have to. You know that it's so it's so far from the stuff you read, even in a writer like Carlyle, or you know I'm I'm currently reading uh, Fustel de Cologne's The Ancient City, and everything in their world is framed by religion. The laws are derivative of religion. The way they deal with property is derivative of religion and faith and the domestic gods and the worship of them and all the rituals around that. That all came first. And it was because of that that the the laws and everything else had a deeper meaning to them that you really could communicate with other people. But as he made, he made the example in his speech, are you really going to turn around to someone on the street tomorrow and say, well, we should all go and die for the righteous and holy king and the the progenitor of God that is King Charles III? Absolutely. Absolutely. And as you say, we're a million miles from what we want and what we need in order to get what we want. And I think it's important to accept that for all sorts of reasons. But the main one is uh, to avoid disappointment because disappointment leads to demoralization. And and of course, that leads to despair. Um, so I think it's important to have reasonable goals. And uh, this is, a, as I say, I think, and I've been at, old-fashioned sort of nationalist conferences one or two where this was the sort of atmosphere and then they couldn't understand why they hadn't got anywhere after you know 70 years and it's because they're simply not addressing the situation as it is mm. or even recognize because as you say that this is a useful way to look at it because the, the thing about seasons because it allows you breathing room it allows you to see the scope of what we're up against instead of uh, well, deluding yourself, really. Do you have any uh, extra thoughts on uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Academic Agents, the uh, the, the wrestling man himself's uh, speech uh, that Panama had? And I, 
I, I saw you kind of looking intently. There was a lot of chin stroking going on, but you t that's how you tend to look when you're watching speeches anyway. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, I, I thought it was, um, I thought it was fantastic um, as usual. I mean, you know, AA lifelong academic and, and, and lecturer. So he's, you know, he's, he's a very natural uh, speech giver, that kind of thing. So, you know, he's al always good. Um, I thought the presentation was very good because if you're going to, do something like he did where he presents his um theses you you can always um make the mistake of just like reading off a list essentially and what i liked is he had this perfect balance of going into detail where it was needed and with some that we just would move on to the next immediately you know yeah. some were just self-explanatory some would need detail i thought i thought he was um uh it's interesting because i i i've heard uh through through the woodwork that he's been uh feeling a little bit uh down of late but i thought he was on absolute top form um i i thought he was you know i thought that was sort of peak aa uh he did work the crowd very well it was peak aa it was quite well. a nice intimate setting yes um it, it it almost felt it almost had like a slight club comedian edge to it dare yes, i right. say cozy yes <laughs> yes I, dare, dare we say cozy <laughs> who is who is this tubby bloke on screen oh no <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if someone's genuinely confused or just uh, giving AA some shit, but uh, that that is actually in fact Mr. AA. Um, uh, those who are confused, I yeah, that was the first time I'd met him, and it was quite uh, quite interesting. Uh, I mean, we just chatted. Uh, I've I've been trying to. Uh, meet up with him for about a year now but he's he's not he, he's he's a very uh private sort of guy and mm. um so it was nice to meet him and we it was very relaxed and uh but as for his speech you know i was very uh jealous of his ability to just talk to the audience and panama hat as well uh to be honest it's right. something that i've never mastered you know i i always um i can improvise off the cuff if something occurs to me but I, I would be scared. I'd oh, be no, so scared to go there without a script. <laughs> that's that's something I've I've kind of dealt with myself doing speeches I've done. I felt the well, the one I probably did the best was the the last Nomos one in Birmingham. But I think that was a consequence of the fact that I'd been thinking about that for months, put that speech together months prior, and just kept re reading it and reading it and reading it until you know all I had to do was glance at the page to get my lines whereas yeah you know this one because we'd been so busy on the run-up i'd only had you know small periods of time to read through it and i think i still got through it all right but i don't know again i you know if you asked me a question on the stage there i could have talked about it for 20 minutes but if i had to you know that the in between between going off the cuff with a little bit of sort of something to get the ball rolling and the reading a speech word for word i just i really yeah. struggle with that i mean in between if, if i could if, I, if this isn't too much of a kind of uh torturous way of uh analogizing it i think that public speaking is a bit like trying to start an engine in in, in cold weather you know you sort of you sort of kick kick the engine mm. up and you have to go through a period of sort of getting into gear and then once you're kind of cruising, it's all good. So you've but, got like you, some kind of choke developed then. <laughs> you've, 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 you've always got to kind of jumpstart the engine somehow um, and get yourself into your stride because everybody, whether they like, you know, whether they're somebody that gives a speech practically every day or whatever, as they step out on stage in front of an audience to give a speech, they will have that, that slight, that's that nervousness and that hesitancy. And everybody has their own way of breaking it. The most common method traditionally is to start with a joke mm. and get the audience to laugh, which is, you know, there are, there are guides to public speaking that kind of look down their nose at it and go, oh, what a cliche, you know, start with a joke. But it always works. You know, if you can make the audience laugh first thing or do something to get their attention, it, it will work and you, you'll get over that, that sort of um, that clinch and, you know, basically get, get cruising, really. And then once, once, once you're at speed... Um, you could do whatever you want because the nervousness will have gone and you'll be in the stride. Well, I am aware of the fact that we, or shall I say, Mr. Hat is running on a bit of a tight schedule this evening. So do we have anything yes. we My wish to add as a sort of final <laughs> uh, 
comment. I know we had our, uh, there's still your speech, Scrump. I'm not sure if you want to go over that in the sort of last bit of time we've got left, or I can give a quick. Mine was very very basic. I'll be I'll be uploading it on like I said on Thursday, but mine was even more kind of nuts and bolts than Hats was. I was a little bit. I, I, my delivery wasn't the best. I was very tired, and I don't know. I wasn't. I, in the in the week before the event, not to plead, uh, not to plead sympathy, but I was really rather ill, um, like a, a bit bed bound to be honest. I've been kind of up and down with my health recently. I'm a, I'm awaiting a little bit of surgery actually, but um, I I wasn't really able to perfect it, and it was kind of a. I was just happy to be there really, and happy to to not be feel, feeling particularly unwell that day. But it, the the thrust of my speech, mine was just. It was literally just called you know, practical descent. It was really it sidestepped it. It was it was wants and needs. I I did as as I said in the intro of it. I uh, it's kind of the uh, the speaker and the organizer's privilege to sidestep their own theme. But really, <laughs> it was more about like right. It's not what we want. It's like what identifying what we need. And it's really really basic things like we need money. We need lawyers is a big thing. I know that's something we talked a little about a little bit off air. Um, last time you were on uh, Millennial Wars, but it, it kind of it really stuck with me. And you, you're you're right, and a lot of people have mentioned that to me. It's just that we need we need legal professionals, and the first thing we need to even just talk is to not be sued out of existence the moment we open our mouths, mm -hmm. which is something that doesn't currently happen. You know, if you've I, I mentioned Extinction Rebellion and people like Just Stop Oil and and Black Lives Matter and all these activist groups, like before before the first like head was glued to a road. Uh, they had millions of dollars from people whose pockets were billions deep, and they had lawyers lined up. They had, uh, in the in the case of Black Lives Matter, uh, friendly DAs lined up with bail reform um, lined up. They they had all of that stuff in place, and that's really it's not the strength of their ideas or the strength of their cause or even how fanatical their supporters are. Or that that does have a an impact. There is a kind of an enthusiasm gap on on the on the right really. Uh, what matters is that they have like massive legal resources, and they're able to bail people out quickly, and they're able to get like the the normal stuff that any successful organization or movement has in place. And we, as as you talked about money and worlds, as you talked about hat as well, that stuff is kind of like crawl, walk, run. Mm -hmm. The 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 eighteen months to Downing Street thing is is insane because we don't have like a proper community yet. We can just about, just about manage things like shieldings and nomads. We can manage kind of weekend retreats. We can manage kind of small event, big event as we kind of do the small night out on Friday and a big night out on Saturday with the speeches. And that's kind of where we are. The first, the first of our events in Manchester was about community and localism, purely specifically mm -hmm. about that. And my speech of that was called welcome to the real world with like a picture of Morpheus. Um, <laughs> And it was like, right, look to your right, look to your left. If they turn the internet off tomorrow, like if they start coming for you, this might be the only people you have some exactly. use of it. Who, who, who are your contacts? Where is your network? Yeah. Because, and as, as, you, as you said, it must be robust. You know, if, if the internet went off tomorrow, make sure that you could still get in contact with everybody. You know, make, make sure that the organization would remain and it wouldn't just immediately disintegrate. It's, uh, it's sorry, cool. I don't want to not to single you out. We are the remnants because you're right. Uh, he said, "Just stop. Oil exists as pure astroturf. They do, but what we're doing is we're watering like a bare lawn in the desert, and all our neighbors have all this fake grass, and we're going. Why don't we have any grass? Why? Well, I'm trying my best. Why won't my grass grow? It's like no, they they don't have any grass either. They just make it look like they do. Mm. It's it's kind of like how do you astroturf your own movement almost? It's, it's yeah, that's the, <laughs> yeah. The, because the the reason why it's astroturfed is because we know from the moment they do something that doing that thing alone was the purpose of setting the whole movement up. You know, this is something I know me and you scrum have talked in private a number of times about the, the number of things that you can do that seem on the face of them like these massive impactful things to normies. But anyone that actually knows anything about how internet activism works or you know, basic funding for movements would be instantly be able to go, all oh, right, that's a load of crap. That's agit prop. That's astroturfing. Yeah. You know, it's because these things are made to serve some form of ulterior purpose. And that, that, that's not to say that we should only look at what we do in a Machiavellian sense, but we should understand where and when our resources go and to what purpose they serve when they do go somewhere. Well, I just said, if you completely strip out the ideology, if you look at it like we were... 
we were like a, a, a NIMBY activism group, if we were the, let's say, you know, uh, Milton Keynes Society of Not Cutting Down the Trees, like what would the Milton Keynes Society of Not Cutting Down the Trees need? Uh, they did money. Uh, they'd probably need some kind of legal representation if they did any kind of protest. And and they would need an actual organization with people trusted to handle the money to do the organization with. It sounds simple, but that doesn't exist yet. Mm. That's, again, what I tried to stress. It's like we don't have – there's no, like, treasurer we trust to to give the money to the lawyers. And it sounds like people go, oh, well, oh, we, we, we turn it into a real thing. We'll get destroyed. It's just like, well, it, it's so – everyone else has that. Even the smallest, like, activist group, the most obscure mm. activist group will generally have that. They'll have maybe a lawyer they're friendly with, and they'll have some kind of like company treasurer, and they'll actually be a thing. And that, unfortunately, is it's a hard hurdle. There needs to be kind of firewalls, and it. it needs to be separated. It can't be done naively, but it's not something that exists. And it's it's. I wanted to leave people with something that they could do now, that they could go away and be like, right, I may not be able to do anything else, but I can get, I can have a whip round, you know, a, get get some of my internet mates, my real mates, we'll, we'll put a tenner in. And we'll have like 60 quid between us. We can, whenever this comes up, we can give it to it. Or, or I'm going to ask my friends who I know are like paralegals or lawyers who might be friendly just to start putting the word out, just to start asking people. It's like, right, if the shit goes down, who do we talk to? Just make contacts and, you know, save, save, you get your own house in order, save your own money, you know, get yourself into a position where you can support yourself and support each other. But just have that mindset of, chip away at the mountain, you know, get get your shovel out and start digging. And it, it seems un insurmountable when we talk about lofty things like, you know, should we be atheists? Should we be pagans? And it, it's really, really silly when it's like, well, we, we're not anything because we don't have like a pot to piss in mm. as, as a movement. Yeah. There, there is no movement. And if there was a movement, it'd be completely threadbare. Um, and that's, it's, it's not a black pill. I thought a lot of people consider that like a black belt outlet. It's not. It's like, look, you can immediately be doing something constructive, material, and useful right now. And that's what I wanted to leave people with. It's the, my, my kind of four points were literally just monetary, legal, organizational, and then you can move on to doing things practically. But you need, you need things in place before you can think about doing absolutely anything before you can you know disappear into magical thinking and talk about being in uh number 10 dynasty you see well the more i think about it the more i don't know who that is because i know <laughs> several people i know several people who went that route and it all and it all went really 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 badly there's mm. there's a oh, set well. of of delusional people Let, let's kind of allow exist. him the let's allow him the luxury of anonymity i don't want to <laughs> I don't. I, it's 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 um. It was. It's not actually someone that I know. It was. It was something that the guy said publicly on a video. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. No. 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 I, I know. But, um, it's, have you ever seen the show The Thick of It? Yes. Um. There's a great one where someone leaves uh, Malcolm like a cake that just says "cunt" on it, and he is like, "This <laughs> this could be from anyone." <laughs> <laughs> and it's like that. It's just like idiot who got into politics and thought he would win, and then gets destroyed. I'm like this. This could be literally. There's like ten people I know. This could be. What? <laughs> yeah, that to, to to ruin the uh, the humor that's in the air of a moment. But it is it is very simple, and that is I think the thing at the moment that we need to have, you know be sort of retrospective about. We are so far away from winning that the things that we can do are actually really easy. It's things like turn up to Namos. Is support content creators that are producing things or, you know, help throw in your weight behind actualizing, you know, it's, I know some people think of the, ooh, the grift or this, that, and the next thing, but to some extent we need products, we need things we can market, we need things that we can turn around and look back on that, you know, aren't just the playlist of YouTube videos, they need to be things like books and works of art and you know, memories from evenings like Nomos or from weekends like Shieldings, you know, the stuff that when people think back on it, they go, Joe, that that was worth it. You know, I, I may have been a social pariah to some people. You know, I, I may have risked, you know, doxing or God forbid this, that or the next thing, which I really don't think is as much of a risk as some people assume it to be. But that, you know, that it was worth it to be there and just experience it. And that you put your work and you put your time and effort towards something bigger than yourself. Absolutely. I mean, it, and it is very rewarding. 
and you feel like you've achieved something afterwards, which is, uh, which is great. I mean, it's what life's all about, really. Well, no, I've, um, I've seen so a Knight Rider of Albion in chat, who I believe is a fellow uh, Welsh mafia aficionado. Yes, a good, a good friend of mine. Yeah, <laughs> honest to God, I found tonight's discussion more productive in terms of motivation and direction than the last event. I'm not so sure if I would entirely agree with that sentiment, but I get the idea you're suggesting, which is, you know, no matter how big the gathering is, when you always come together with a purpose, it's so much more productive. I mean, I yes, think exactly. that, you know, even the fact that that's. It's going to be less than 90 minutes our stream this evening, but I don't think we've really missed a single detail that could highlight how good uh, last Saturday night was. Oh, we have missed one detail, though, because Right Honourable Fez, a, uh, a regular weaver and longtime friend of the channel, has donated £10. Thank you very much. And he says, great pleasure to see old friends and meet new ones. Great pleasure to talk with all of you. Hope you all join us. Uh, for the pop-up night, yes, I'd, I I was going to show this at the end, but the pop-up night at the Cathedral at Zero One Soho on Saturday, the 26th of November, we actually gave out some of the Cathedral's uh, business cards mm. um, at Nomos. And I would I would advise people to uh, seek out the Weavers, if you can. I'll put a link uh, in the comments. I don't, I don't have anything to hand Sorry, right I think now. You, I think you find it's Don't Fear the Weavers. You don't feel the weavers. But yes, there will be uh, there will be a weaving night Saturday, twenty sixth of November at zero one Soho. Um, although there may be a password involved, so I'll again. It's we 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 kind of have certain security by obscurity esoterica stuff, but that's kind of one of the things that it's very you know a guy you knock on a door you uh, you you speak a word kind of thing. It's it's all very yeah. yes. Well, I'll uh, if I, I don't have anything to hand right now, but I'll make sure there's something in the description or a pinned comment for the VOD on this. A, so a those... large, a large man with mutton chops will prevent you from entering if you do not have the password. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh God, um, I one of my highlights of the night was uh, someone someone attempting to give AA a hug and his oh. his his horror. His uh, the thing it just it just made it funnier. <laughs> and then it he just was... he turned to us, looked us straight in the eye, and went. <laughs> That is the autistic equivalent of rape. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite an amazing moment, but it's uh, he is he, it's d despite his uh, his privateness and slight I will say slight awkwardness with people. Uh, he's a very good public speaker, and it was nice to see AA come out, and it was and lovely of you to come out as well, um, Wells, and it was good to see you again, Panama Hat. Very, oh, uh, always, always, always a pleasure to see everybody. It, it, it was. I also kind of did it as, uh, as like a. St it was my birthday that day, so it was like a stealth birthday party as well, which is funny. Um, but that was. I'm guessing we're coming to the end of our stream tonight because I know you're on a, you're on a bit of a clock. Yeah, so I, um, I will. Um, I will. I think uh, bow out just now. Um, so okay. Got, well, got I'll. For a quick cup of tea and then I'll go on the next stream. I'll make sure to mention because there's so many different streams going on this evening. I believe. Yes. Pat will be joining um, uh, Apostolic Majesty uh, on the hour at 9 o'clock. A will be on Jay Burden's show. I believe there's also Yez's stream later on tonight. And you yourself, Woz, will be streaming at 10 o'clock as well. And then there might be yeah. some more of the old Glory Club stuff going on amongst some of yes. our American Big friends. Night. Big night. Big um, night. Um, I'm going to double check. I've done all our donations. I think I have. Thank you guys for being generous. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for coming on this evening. Uh, feel free to buy out, bow out. We're just uh, doing the outro right. now, Matt. Just, uh, uh, just, just a quick plug. I'll be appearing now on AM's channel to discuss the 2008 uh, film Valkyrie about the 20th of July plot to kill uh, the H-Man. I won't say his name in case it gets... Yeah, H it, it's, it's the, it's the, the, the film could be called H-Bomber Man, which is funny. <laughs> oh, God. Le leader of the funny party in the 1930s. Um, <laughs> Yes. I've put a link in the chat anyway, so we'll we'll do a handoff. We'll do a handoff now. Then, Very and good. is there anything you guys have to shell apart from that? Um, I will do a quick uh, last shell for people who want to read your speech. Um, um, uh, my speech quick... will be going up on Odyssey in a few days. So oh, okay, we'll make sure yeah. to keep an eye out for that then. Uh, yes, uh, so Coney, current year, just put a very quick snipe at the end there. How do you think London compared to other two venues? It was relatively similar because we try to book mainstream venues, basically, because mm. uh, evening venues in a town centre are much easier to fly under the radar with than going on a college campus and making an arse of yourself. Yes. So that's that will be my closing comment. <laughs> anyway, so, I'll say uh, good night from me then. Good evening from myself as well.
Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for inviting me to the conference. It was great fun. Not a problem. It's great to have you there. Fantastic event overall. We are actually off air now.